Okay, so good morning, everyone from Hong Kong. Um, yeah, and um, and good good morning, everyone. I'm well. Good evening, everyone. I'm I'm here in Toronto. Um, you know, it's great to have people dialing in from all, all over the world. Uh, this is the first in our kind of series of interviews with portfolio companies, and we're very fortunate to have Mance Harmon, who's the CEO of Hedera Hashgraph, kind of kicking things off with us uh, this morning. Yeah, good. So. Good to see you, Hermans. We met first the team of Hedera back in 2017 here in Asia, and we were, we were impressed by the team and specifically by the novel approach the Hedera team actually had to solving scalability and developing a high throughput smart contract blockchain. So we supported the team pretty early on. And, um, and yeah, Mans, why don't we jump right into it and start with a two minute kind of a elevator pitch type of introduction of what Hedera is and thereafter dive in a little bit deeper into into your team and the company. Sure. Yeah. Well, so in terms of eleva elevator pitch, <laughs> Hedera is a global public network that has been built from the ground up to be enterprise grade. Uh, it solves many of the problems, technical problems associated with the first and second generation <laughs> consensus algorithms. It's got fantastic performance best-in-class security. Uh, and then, in addition, we've solved problems with stability, you know, the, the concern that um, the network itself might split because there are people that are upset with governance or product roadmap or something decide to, to fork the network and take their, uh, take the, the state of the network with them elsewhere. And, and we do that through really strong governance. It's an enterprise network governed by uh, the largest companies in the world across geographies uh, that span geographies, span verticals, and ultimately span time. It will be a dynamic global council that provides strong governance of this public platform. Perfect. Okay, well done. Let's start first talking a little bit about the team. So we were impressed by the pedigree of the team when we first met you guys. And um, can you briefly introduce the team and kind of how you got together and who the key people are? Yeah, sure. So, well, Lehman and I, uh, we're, we're the co-founders. We've been working together since 1993. Uh, formal background is computer science for both of us. He's the smart guy. And he's got a PhD from Carnegie Mellon in machine learning, well, computer science with an emphasis in machine learning. We met working for the Air Force Senior Scientist for Machine Intelligence. And of course, the U.S. U.S. Air Force, and uh, from there we taught computer science at the Air Force Academy. I went off and managed a, a massive software program for the Missile Defense Agency here in the U.S. Uh, we decided to become entrepreneurs and have previously started and sold two identity companies: one to a Fortune 500, another one to private equity. And then in 90, in, in, excuse me, 2012 or 13, Lehman wanted to solve this really hard math problem, how to maximize security and maximize performance in distributed consensus at the same time. There's been this trade-off and he wanted to maximize both at the same time. He solved that in 2015. Today we call it Hashgraph as the algorithm. Uh, we started a company, but not until 2017 did we decide to build a public network on the algorithm. And uh, as a result of some investments, we started pulling together uh, the, the core team in 2017. And, and two of the, what we call the 2017 execs, there are four of us on the team today, mm -hmm. me and, and Lehman, Jordan yeah. Freed, who is the head of BD and responsible for recruiting the council and, and working with on-ramps for the company and doing BD for uh, the projects. He came to us because he had previously invested in, in our company. And he's an entrepreneur, uh, background in uh, VPN. Buffer, he's, he was the owner of Buffer VPN. A lot of your viewers might know that. And he sold that spent a year uh, figuring out what he wanted to do next. And we got hooked up as a result of the investment and, and I was able to convince him to join us. Natalie Furman is our general counsel. We made a commitment very early on to 
uh, try to do this in a regulatory compliant way. And that was reflected in the fact that we hired a GC from the very beginning. She's fantastic. She worked in Silicon Valley first uh, in BD and product um, or company strategy before she went to Columbia to get her law degree. She undergrad Stanford, Columbia law degree, uh, went to work for Paul Hastings. Ultimately, I was able to convince her to come work with us and, and she's been with us from the beginning. Because of the focus on enterprise, I, I really wanted good quality enterprise expertise in the company. And I was able to recruit um, Lionel Chacron from Oracle. At Oracle, Lionel was the, the GM, the founding GM of their innovation division with responsibility for IoT, uh, AI, and blockchain. And the, the model that they followed, followed there at Oracle it was precisely the model that I wanted to follow here. We could talk more about that later, but, yep. but I was able to get Leonel to come work with us prior to Oracle. He was the founding GM at Cisco for their IOT division, which is doing billions in, in revenue now. And so Leonel's head of product here at um, Hedera, and he brought with him two of his deputies um, that run, um, product management with him on the tech side, as well as relationship management on the go-to-market side for the company here. Um, Christian Hasker, CMO, was also in the tech industry. He was the head of community development and product marketing at Datastax, which mm -hmm. popularized Cassandra, which is the go-to NoSQL open source database in the market today. Yeah. And uh, so he worked with them to, to accomplish that and then ran a consulting agency to help startups. And I was able to get him to stop doing that and come, <laughs> come work with us full time. Um, oh, one other that's really uh, important to mention as well is, is Brett McDowell. So we have the council, which we'll talk more about. And then we have the staff. And uh, I'm the CEO of the staff and run, run the company and the staff, Brett is the executive director of the council. And so he helps manage and run council operations. And he, prior to joining Hedera, was the founding executive director of FIDO, which is a major, um, a major identity organization in the world today on um, multi-factor authentication. Mm -hmm. And then prior to that, he was head of security, uh, or I shouldn't say head, he played a senior role in security at PayPal, and then also founding member, executive director of Kantara and, and Liberty Alliance, both of which are identity-related organizations in, in, the, in the, you know, the identity space. So you know, we've, been, we've been fortunate to recruit uh, just a fantastic team. Yeah. and. Uh, you know, it's, we, yeah. we, it's, 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 you know, you, you guys have such kind of depth in the team and that's, you know, and, and the experience there's great. And I, I love the fact that you kind of met in, in the military, it's kind of military grade technology. Um, yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, we, we spent a lot of years in the military. Lehman actually retired from the air force after 20. I didn't put in that many. I, I was only in for 11. Uh, but that's where we, you know, that's where we learned, uh, you know, the, the work ethic and all that goes along with of, of living that life. And, and we've been able to then transition to the commercial world and, and sort of bring that with us into, into the organization today. So, so you, know, you, you touched on Lehman, you know, who's obviously kind of hugely respected in the industry. Um, and so maybe we should could kind of jump into the technical side of things. Sure. Um, so, so to start with, you know, Hedera is really kind of a new iteration of distributed ledger technology. So could you kind of explain what the limitations of existing blockchains are and, and why this new approach is needed? Sure. Um, well, the limitations are, there are multiple limitations and, and there's some technical and some non-technical. But if we start with the technical ones first, there are limitations in terms of security 
uh, limitations in terms of performance and limitations in terms of cost as a result of architecture. So for example, um, in blockchain, we, well, blockchain, by the way, is a term that refers to both a data structure as well as a consensus algorithm, a chain of blocks of transactions. And then the consensus algorithm uses proof of work, uh, generally speaking, which is really expensive. It's designed to be slow. And therefore, the, uh, the number of transactions per second are inherently limited and the cost is going to be pretty high. And for example, Bitcoin, I looked it up today, the average cost per transaction is about two and a half bucks. Ethereum, who also is proof of work blockchain, is uh, substantially more than that. I need to look again. Yeah, four dollars and thirty cents per transaction on, on average. Mm -hmm. And you know, blockchain or Bitcoin is at three transactions per second right now, and and Ethereum is about twelve. Well, there's only so much that you can do uh, if you have a computer quote, quote, that can process 12 transactions per second. It's like a calculator in some ways. If you could <laughs> substantially change the throughput, not by an order, a factor of 10, but by a factor of a thousand, uh, then you can do significantly different things. It's like actually having a computer for the first time. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah. And Hashgraph, resolves that problem. So uh, today on the public network, in a throttled fashion, we are at 10,000 transactions per second in terms of capacity. And the cost per transaction is a hundredth of a penny fixed. Uh, and so the, you know, just an enormous difference in terms of throughput and cost. In terms of security, remember I said Lehman wanted to maximize both performance and security at the same time, the best that you can do theoretically in, in security is, is something called asynchronous Byzantine fault tolerance. There are a lot of algorithms out there that are BFT. Uh, most of the POS, uh, proof of stake platforms are some form of BFT in the market today. ABFT means that you don't have to make assumptions to prove that the network will converge or to come to consensus that you do have to make if you're only using BFT. For example, um, DDoS attacks. If, if you're only BFT, then you have to assume that it's not the case that DDoS attacks can be levered, levied excuse me, against the leader that's in your algorithm. The BFT algorithms typically have some form of leader or coordinator but perhaps, you could just, just, perhaps you could just explain quickly what a DDoS attack is. Oh, yeah, sure. So the idea is that if there is a leader or coordinator that's coordinating the flow of information across all the nodes in the network, then they're a natural target. If it's possible to uh, electronically flood that computer with enough traffic that you can prevent it from... Uh, practically fulfilling its role. A, a great example by analogy is if you have a telephone and I want to target you with a denial of service attack, that's what uh, DOS stands for. DDoS is distributed denial of service attack. I could, I could hire a bunch of people, that would be the distributed component of this analogy, to call your phone repeatedly. And that would effectively prevent you from actually. That's actually being able a good example for it. Yeah. 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 That's a DDoS attack, yeah. except it would be yeah. done by computers example, on a leader computer in a public distributed network, effectively bringing, preventing the network from coming to consensus. If you're not ABFT, then you have this problem. Uh, and, and there are various ways to try and mitigate the problem, but you inherently have a problem that you have to try to mitigate versus. If you have an ABFT algorithm, it's just not possible in the same ways. And, and that's the advantage of uh, the tech. The, the tech is that it is incredibly fast, lots of throughput, really low cost, and it's got the best security in the market. That's a, that's a, a great introduction. M maybe we can dive a little bit deeper into, into kind of the hash graph consensus algorithm. Mm -hmm. you know, so this is really, I guess I would think of this as like the beating heart of the network. And how yeah. did you're able to do all of these kind of have this amazing scalability with the security? Sure. Um, 
So, so let me just draw a comparison between proof of work blockchain and and Hashgraph. I think I think providing the comparison is is maybe a little bit helpful. In yep. Bitcoin and Ethereum, what you have are the the miners. Um, they each have a local copy of the chain of blocks of transactions. And when transactions flow in from the users, Alice wants to pay Bob a coin, a Bitcoin or, or, or whatever. That transaction goes to all the different miners in the network and all the miners collect all the transactions, put them into a block, and then they compete with one another to try and solve a really hard math problem. And it, the one that solves that math problem first takes the solution to the math problem and puts it in his block that he's created of transactions and sends it to all the other miners. And when the miners receive it, they check that solution. That is the proof of work done, right? That's where the term comes from. They check that, yeah, he's actually solved this, this math problem. And therefore, we're going to take this block that he sent us and put it on top of the chain. We all are going to do that. That's how you increase the size of the blockchain. Sometimes um, you have multiple miners solving a puzzle, the puzzle, at about the same time. And when that happens, you have to go through a process that allows the community to come to agreement on which block came first. And for that reason, blockchain is slow. It, it has to be slow because it can take a while for the community of miners to come to agreement on which of the miners actually solve that, that crypto puzzle first. And so every 10 minutes by design, there's a new block that goes on top of the blockchain for Bitcoin, for example. It's very linear in terms of the, both the data structure and, and then the consensus algorithm is actually designed to be slow, slow things down. In Hashgraph, we don't have miners. We, we do have node operators to use a different term. Um, but there is no proof of work that's taking place. What they do is they keep a local copy of a data structure, in the same way miners keep a copy of the blockchain. In Hashgraph, all the node operators keep a copy of the hash graph. And what is the hash graph? The, the hash graph represents the flow of information across the network. So if I'm a, a, a node operator and I want to submit a payload, perhaps it's a cryptocurrency transaction, then what I do is I, I create that payload and I gossip that to all the other miners. I, I call, uh, excuse me, node operators. I call a node operator and when I pass that information to the node operator, I'm passing some metadata. And the metadata that I'm passing along with that payload describes where I got the payload, who I received the payload from. And that's really important. And by looking at the metadata associated with the packages, as, as all these transactions just automatically flow to all the different node operators, all the node operators are looking at the metadata with each new payload that comes in, and they can then see the, where that metadata come from. In other words, they can see who knew what and when they knew it in the flow of the information. And when they get that information, they update their local copy of the hash graph, which is the graph that describes who knew what and when they knew it. And they, and provably, they all have an identical copy through a moment in time. They all have an identical copy of this graph of who knew what and when, which is all the information that you need to know. If you want to use a 30-year-old voting algorithm from the world of distributed consensus decades ago that has fantastic security properties, you just apply that Con that consensus algorithm to the graph that you have here in front of you, and you can then calculate how all the members of the network would vote on the order of transactions if you were asking them to vote. Now, this is the advance. This is what's new. These voting algorithms go back decades, and they're impractical, Im impractical because in order for them to work, you have to get all the operators, node operators, 
to vote on the order of transactions. And the way they do that is by sending their vote over the network. And the uh, amount of bandwidth that require, is required to process the voting just blows up exponentially in the number of nodes and the number of transactions. What Lehman figured out is that you could create a hash graph that has all the information that you need to calculate the vote. And you can do that. And because all the node operators have an identical hash graph and they're using the same exact consensus algorithm to calculate the votes, they all come up with the same calculations. In other words, they're in consensus on the order of transactions without ever having to send the transaction over the internet, not even once or excuse me, a vote, without ever having to send the votes over the internet. You don't vote over the internet. You calculate votes locally. And because of that, it's incredibly efficient. Um, the transactions flow to the different node operators only once or twice, and that's it. You don't use up bandwidth, and it's got the very best security guarantees that you can theoretically achieve. Uh, it's just a fantastic advance in the state of the yeah. art. And that conceptually is how it works. That's, that's great. I want to also, can we talk a little bit about um, the, the kind of HBAR, which is the, the cryptocurrency associated with Hedera and, and kind of, I guess, you know, how that's used in the network? Yeah, so um, it's used in two ways. One is to provide the security of the network. And the other one is to sort of provide the fuel, if you want to think of it that way. Let's start with the fuel. That's, that's easiest. Um, we provide a set of services uh, on the platform. And what I, what I mean by that is think of it sort of like Amazon Web Services, AWS. You know, developers um, will use AWS to build applications. They'll make API calls to AWS to build applications. The same thing is true here. Developers that want to build distributed applications make API calls to our network. When they do so, they pay at that moment in time for the API call, for the work that's going to be required to process that transaction. And they pay the node that receives that call, our cryptocurrency, HBAR. And as, as I said, it's, it's a hundredth of a penny for a cryptocurrency transaction and and also one of our other uh, services, the consensus service. And, and there are different pricing for smart contracts and file storage, but that's the idea. We receive the, the revenue, the HBAR, and we turn around and would then sell it back into the market uh, you know, through the exchanges. And that's the economy. That's, that's how the HBAR uh, makes it possible to use the network. In terms of security, it's absolutely required to ensure the security of the network from a certain kind or class of attack called Sybil attacks. And, and basically, here's, here's the idea. Um, the, math, the way the math works out, the node operators, at least two thirds of them need to agree on the order of transactions when they're voting. And as long as two thirds will agree on the order of transactions, then you come to consensus. If you have 100 computers, and you're, you're ne never going to have more than 100 computers, for example, um, and you know all of the operators, then you don't have to worry. You know, each computer could just be one vote. And as long as two-thirds of them come up with uh, agreement, then, then you can agree on the order of transactions. However, if you were to allow more computers, and you were to allow perhaps anonymous computers, to join the network, then a bad actor could stand up enough anonymous computers to participate in voting so that they accomplish, they account for at least a third or more of the nodes, and then they could stop the transactions from, or the, the consensus from happening. The way you solve that problem And just is, quickly, and so, so an example of that would be they would be able to censor and basically kind of prevent some transactions from happening. They would prevent the network from agreeing on the order of transactions. So they could actually stop uh, the, the progress of the computer. If you're wanting to see a stream of transactions in consensus order, say like a stream of, let's just call it a cryptocurrency, a stream of cryptocurrency transactions in consensus order so that you can update your ledger appropriately, they could stop the stream. 
they could, they could stop it dead in its tracks. <laughs> and if they had two thirds, if they added enough nodes that they actually had two thirds of the nodes in the computer, uh, in the network, then they could dictate the order of transactions. It gets worse, right? So it's, it's one they could stop and then subsequently they could dictate the order of transactions if they could get enough. Yep. So how do you solve that problem? Um, what we do is instead of giving one computer one vote, we say, however many coins you, node operator, control, that's the weight of your vote. So we have a fixed supply of coins, 50 billion tokens, and all the nodes that are calculating consensus um, vote the weight of the number of coins that they have. And as long as a bad actor doesn't control a third or more of the token supply, then they can't, they can't stop consensus, nor can they dictate the order of transactions. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's really important for the coin. And so what we have to do over time is ensure that the token price is high enough and that the token distribution is broad enough Mm -hmm. that we can be comfortable allowing anonymous nodes in the network to participate in consensus. Today, it's yeah. a closed network in the sense that the node operators are just the council members. Yeah. Uh, in the future, it will be an open network in that anonymous right. nodes can participate, but not until we've achieved the, that goal of, of uh, making it practically impossible for a bad actor yeah. to buy up yeah. a third of the coins. That, that brings us actually to the hot topic of governance, right? Um, speaking about controls of the networks, governance, you have made some significant announcements about your governance council. Could you talk a little bit about um, who those governance council's members are and what their role is um, yeah. with regards to consensus um, and, and, and protecting the network? Yeah. Sure. Well, so, um, you know, when we first started all this, we knew that governance was going to be critically important and yeah. that the lack of governance just leads to chaos or sort of anarchy. And we saw that a lot in the earlier days of the industry. We still see it. We still see hostile, <laughs> hostile takeovers and, and you know, forking of, of, of platforms, which creates problems for the applications running on the platforms, et cetera. So we knew that we needed strong governance. To address that, what I did was read a book by a guy named D. Hawk. D. Hawk is the founder of the Visa network before it was called Visa, Bank of Americard network. He wrote a book yep. called One from Many. And in that book, he outlined the governance model that they ended up adopting way back in the 1960s. And it really almost directly applied. I took the principles from that and applied them here. What that looks like ultimately is a council of 39 leading global organizations that um, span industries, that sp span geographies, and again, ultimately span time in the sense that they can't be permanent council members. They can be members for up to two, three-year terms for a total of six years, mm -hmm. and then they have to move off the council and somebody takes their place. Um, they actually govern, and, and it's important to, this is not just a marketing agreement. What I mean is that Hedera is an LLC, a Delaware-based LLC, and these council members are members of the LLC. They are Hedera, they own Hedera, and they each have an equal um, vote in the governance of Hedera. And, and they govern things like um, you, you know, feature product decisions, product roadmap, the fees that we charge, the node incentives that we pay, they manage treasury. And, and, and who is on that council? Today, yeah, the members today, they're 15 so far. Yeah. And just to do a quick rundown, Google, uh, Magazine Luisa out of Brazil, Tata Communications, Zane Group out of the Middle East, DLA Piper, actually out of Hong Kong, Hong Kong office, yeah. uh, yeah. Boeing, FIS WorldPay out of um, London, LG out of mm -hmm. uh, Korea, Wipro, Avery Dennison, Deutsche Telekom out of uh, Germany, of course, IBM, 
Numora out of Tokyo and University College of London. Oh. Those are the first 15. Yeah. And so, so these are, I'm oh, sorry, you go. No, go ahead. Um, so these are some significant names, obviously, and especially compared to some of the other blockchain protocols and companies and projects. Um, so what makes, given, given those council members, what makes Hedera particularly well suited for enterprise adoption? And what kind of, what's their rationale of working with you and not with others? Yeah. Well, you have to think about what the problems are that's prevented enterprises from adopting. And yeah. um, a governance is a big part of it. So the tech... Yeah is important, of course. Um, an architecture of the technology is actually important, which I wanna talk about momentarily because it's, it's actually critically important. The, the architecture, how we are going to market with, uh, with the product, what the product is and how we're going to market. But when we look at enterprises that are gonna spend millions of dollars building on top of a public network, they, do have concerns over who is governing that network. You know, what mm -hmm. group of, of people or individuals or organizations have responsibility for product roadmap and, uh, you know, people that they can trust not to sort of pull the rug out from under them in the future. That, yeah. and, and so these organizations are part of us today, not only because they, um, they have their own applications that they need to, to build on a public network with our properties, but because they have a direct hand in the governance, they, they know what the product roadmap is going to be because they sit on the tech steering committee and they help approve the product roadmap. Yeah. Uh, and so that's a big deal. Yeah. The other thing though, is that if you look at the product itself, we, we have Hashgraph as a consensus algorithm. And then we have several services. We have cryptocurrency as a service. We do have file storage and smart contracts, but those are sort of lesser, they're support services. We introduced something called the Hedera Consensus Service, which is a change in the fundamental model for, you can call it smart contracts if you like. When you look at the other public networks today, the... Um, like Ethereum or EOS or any of them, Algorand, yep. they all do two functions fundamentally. They, they do put transactions in the consensus order, but then they take those transactions and they operate on them in smart contracts of some form on the network. And this, this is fundamentally limited in that uh, if you have a smart contract running on a public network, it's running all, all the nodes of the public network, and if the smart contract says, I want to add A to B, you need to know the values of A and B, you know, yeah. seven and eight to come up with 15, which means the information flowing through the smart contract can't be private. And that's a problem, right? If you yeah. care about privacy, then you don't want to use smart contracts. Also, because they're running on these nodes in the public network, they're the, the resources available uh, is very limited and they're competing with all the other smart contracts on the same network, which means you yep. can't scale and the cost is going to be sky high, which is exactly what we're seeing in Ethereum today. Yeah, with yeah. Yeah. Crates, right? So what we did was we, we changed the model. We exposed the consensus algorithm, which is Hashgraph, but we've taken the smart contract layer and we've moved it off chain and put it into what we call an app net, an application network. You can still have multiple net, uh, nodes in this application network that are yep. running the business logic that would normally be run on network. Now mm -hmm. it's a single application network for that application. It's not shared with all the other universe of, of smart contract developers out there. You've got the privacy that you care about. You got the low cost that you care about and you're leveraging the trust of a public network in Hedera. And all Hedera mm -hmm. does for you is put your transactions in order. So mm -hmm. to give it, make it very concrete, you could put a ledger in your app net. You could have a dozen different companies running a copy of the ledger on their node in the application network. You can have transactions, Alice pays Bob, a, you know, a, a token that flows through the Hedera consensus service 
the consensus service puts all the transactions in order and streams them back to that application network. All the nodes in the network update their copy of the ledger and you have a distributed ledger that is private and can scale and is low cost with fantastic mm -hmm. performance with the, the trust, uh, the level of trust that you get in a public network governed by a council like Hedera's. That model is critically important to enterprise, right? Because it solves all their problems that they, they can't solve in, in the public networks. I think that's actually a great segue. You know, I think that you, you spoke really clearly about um, the kind of competitive landscape, almost from, from kind of a technical perspective, but maybe moving on to more of like a, a practical um, kind of use case perspective, you know, clearly there are all these other smart contract platforms like Ethereum and Solana and Neo, all, all, so many different ones. You know, are you targeting different types of users or different types of applications? Yeah. So, so to answer that, let me, let me just answer it in the context, <clears throat> excuse me, of the big picture of the project. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna just describe the, the project over the course of years, because I think it's relevant and it, it will help. In 2017, we, you know, we, we cast a vision and we wrote it all down in a white paper and we recruited the initial uh, team. In 2018, we raised a lot of money and we launched the network in the fall of 2018. It was closed, not open to the public, but it was operational and we had developers come using it. In 2019, we operationalized the council. In February of 2019, we had our first council meeting with the first five members and we've been adding members ever since and, and giving council more and more control of the entire organization. We're way down that path today in terms of actually having committees that manage and have provide oversight, et cetera, et cetera. This year has been a year of validation. So we opened the network in 2019 to the public in fall of 2019. And what we've done is been, we started with like a dozen ideas for use cases that we thought would take advantage of the peculiar um, properties of the platform. You know, it's throughput and, and low cost, et cetera. And we narrowed it down to, really a couple, you, you could say three if you include identity, but identity is sort of core to everything in the world, right? Mm -hmm. Outside of identity, really there are a couple. And the way that we've been validating the, the use case categories is by both doing our own research as well as looking at what the market is building on top of the platform. And in that context, what we've observed is that Data integrity in its most general sense is a major category for us. Tokenization is a major category of use case for us and identity. And so when we think about tokenization, for example, you know, we've got DLA Piper that is building um, a platform for tokenizing commercial real estate, helping uh, organizations take their, their tokens to market. FPOS, which is Australia's debit card system, they are um, they're, they're building a, a stable coin on us and using that for micropayments uh, in, uh, in, in the digital world, and, and they have all kinds of ideas. Um, Red Swan is also doing commercial real estate tokenization. Diamond Standard is tokenizing diamonds on us. And there are others, which, you know, just sort of... Um, we, we, you know, we work with them and the market came to us. And it's important because of this HCS model. You can have a totally customized token if you want in an application network. And that gives you know, companies that are serious about their tokens, you know, that need high customization of their tokens, it gives them total flexibility to do that. So that's, that's one thing. Data integrity though, because HC, you can think of HCS as just a uh, sort of like a global public notary service in one sense. You take a blob of information, you submit it to HCS, it gets a consensus timestamp on it, and then passes it back. And in the future, you can prove that that information has not been altered or changed, and you can prove that it was what it was at a moment in time. Just mm -hmm. those properties alone 
open up all kinds of use cases like content authenticity for the media, coupon fraud mitigation, consumer privacy management and consent, health data integrity and access, product authenticity, provenance, database integrity, IoT asset data integrity, advertising fraud. And I list those specific use cases and I'll just list industries, media, retail, travel, hospitality, e-commerce, health, pharma, supply chain, FMCG, uh, and digital advertising. And the reason I'm listing all of those is because we have customers today on, on graph, not on chain, but on graph, on the main net, that do exactly that. They're real applications that are taking advantage of HCS uh, to solve those specific use case problems. So um, yeah, the, 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 the focus areas are data integrity and tokenization supported by identity. That's, that's great. Yeah, I, I think I saw an announcement yesterday about Hedera processing more transactions per day than Ethereum now. That's, that's my understanding. Yeah, a million five. So uh, that's fantastic. The growth has been great to see. I mean, when we launched the network a year ago, we were at three or four transactions per second out of the chute, which in itself is an amazing thing <laughs> that you would start at that. And, and now, uh, yesterday, I believe we were at 20 TPS. I can't do the math, but I think it's about a million and a half transactions per day, which is twice, you know, it's twice what Ethereum was doing, is doing today. I don't know what they were doing at the end of their first year. You know? Yeah. Oh, that's oh what yesterday, did. by the way, was, was the anniversary. So okay. September 16th oh. <laughs> was the one year anniversary of the launch of the network. Well, happy anniversary. Yeah, thank happy you. Happy anniversary. Yeah. I think maybe just kind of a, a final question before from us before we jump into some Q&A. Um, is, you know, looking, looking ahead maybe five, ten years, like what excites you most about the, the future of Hedera? Um, I am very excited to see the growth and acceptance of the enterprise when it comes to public public networks um i you know when we started this we honestly believed that we were going to change the way the economy worked in some fundamental ways and it's not just financial services organization obviously i mean fi service is a big is a big category for crypto or or dlt but we thought that this would open up the opportunity for fundamentally new business models that could solve some real problems uh, socially in, in, in the world that we, we have today. And I know you all sort of understand what those are. And I think that's true. I think that we can make a, a serious uh, impact in changing the business models that incentivize good behavior rather than poor behavior, at least provide alternative business models to the ones that are used today. And, um, you know, we're, we're, sort of, we're sort of where we were in 1993. We're still that early uh, by analogy, right? Mosaic and Netscape days. We, we're still, maybe we're a little beyond that, but not a lot. And um, so I, I think the world's going to change. We're just glad to be a part of it. Yeah. yeah, well, it's obviously hugely exciting, and we're very excited for the next kind of five to ten years of what you guys are building. Um, well, th thank you so much for kind of answering our questions. I think we've, we've, if it's okay, we've still got about kind of fifteen minutes or so uh, to sure. do some Q and A. So, so for everyone um, on the call, uh, there is a Q and A uh, button at the bottom of your screen, um, and you can submit questions there. Um, and yeah. I think we've actually already had a few in. Yeah, we have. Okay, we have in the first few questions should i just start reading out like i, I would suggest we just go through one by one and um, yeah again for our uh, investors just submit them uh, at the bottom um, so first one being um, is the project purely focused on the us market or are there or the, are these ambitions global and if so what role does asia play in your strategy oh it's absolutely global and the council the council is a global council I don't know how many of, of those council members I mentioned are in Asia. Of course, LG is there. DLA Piper yeah. is actually out of the Hong Kong office. Yeah. Nomura is in, in Japan. Uh, yeah. I may be missing some. The use cases are global as well. Um, and we, we, we want more representation from Asia. We do have uh, 
employees in in Asia and in Japan and in Seoul. Uh, and so there's in yeah, there, there's a, a big emphasis. It's an important market for us, and it really has to be part of this uh, this network to make it what we envisioned it would be a global a global governance council that represents all use cases and all geographies on a global basis. Okay, good. Next question. Um, given that you well, okay, let me read that. Given that you have Deutsche Telekom, Germany's largest telco operating on your governance council, could you share more how Hedera may be useful for telco companies in general? And could this be relevant for Asian telco companies in a similar way? Yeah, well, there are a couple of um, there are a couple of use cases that immediately come to mind. One is, without going into the details, the idea of using a public ledger to help combat spam. Uh, it, it is not spam. Um, you know, robocalling, <laughs> the the, yeah. the phone spam that we all get all the time. There there <laughs> yeah. there are ways of of be, you know trying to address that problem using a public ledger. The other one is cross carrier settlement charges for roaming charges, Set cross carrier settlement of roaming charges. You would be really surprised to understand and know if I'm, an, I'm a Verizon user. And then, so if I go to Europe and I use orange, you know, roaming, the, um, the problems in the process that are, is associated with settling those charges between Verizon and Orange uh, is, is amazing. It can take months for those settlements to happen, and sometimes it may not happen at all. And so there's an opportunity to really streamline that process and provide quicker settlement and more accurate settlement, which would benefit all the carriers. Those are two that immediately come to mind. And, and there's nothing special about a geography, you know, all, yeah. all the geographies share yeah. that same common infrastructure and problem set. And maybe just to explain that more technically, it, it's really because you have these two carriers, like you said, Orange and, and Verizon are running on different databases. So they can't come to agreement as to, you know, when your minutes, you know, wh how long your call was or, you know, whatever. Whereas if they can use something like Hashgraph Adara, they can basically be on a shared database and therefore can instantly come to agreement and consensus as to what that's right. That's right. That's yeah. right. I mean, that, and maybe just a word on that. When I think about distributed ledger technology, I don't think about ledgers. Conceptually, what I think about is a multi party, multi master database. A multi master database is when you have multiple nodes that each can accept reads and writes at the same time and all the nodes can stay in sync. And that technology has been around for a long time. What's new, what Bitcoin, I guess you could say, introduced was this notion that instead of one party operating all the masters, like Amazon would operate all the master nodes for its, for its books database, yep. you can have this notion where different organizations or people are responsible for administering their local copy of a master. And that introduces a whole set of security concerns. And the new algorithms like Hashgraph address those security concerns and make it possible to have multi-master, multi-party databases. And you can use them in the way that you just described exactly. You could have the telcos all running a copy of the same database all writing and reading to their local copy at the same time and all the databases being updated in near real time. And yeah, that yeah. common view of the information makes it possible to, to reduce errors and do settlement, you know, like that compared to okay. what we have to do today. Perfect. I think that should, should well answer it. Next question. So we have a few questions coming in now. Um, I think partially we may have answered that already, but I'll still read it out and see if we can add to that. There are many prominent council members running validator nodes on Hedera. What is their goal of doing so? What does a council member company benefit from engaging as a validator? And um, yeah, in terms of benefits beyond um, kind of net uh, financial benefits. Yeah. yeah. Well, there are really two categories of council members for us. I mean, all of the council members could fit into the category that perhaps they either today or in the future will have use cases that will require a public network. And it, 
you know, they have comfort in, in knowing that they're helping to govern the public network that they end up choosing to use. Many of the council members today started there. They have use cases and they want to, and they want to be a part of the organization uh, to both to learn, you know, to have a front row seat to the industry as well as, as guide the organization because of self-interest. The other category of use of, of uh, council member though, is that they represent a channel. They have customers that are asking for um, quote blockchain services or, or distributed ledger services. And what we provide them is a product offering that, that they can offer. And as, as Hedera continues to mature and an understanding of the use cases and the value that they bring is, is better formulated and, and uh, uh, proven out then they become channel partners for Hedera and, uh, and they end up helping scale those use cases in the marketplace. Okay. okay, perfect. So next one is a bit of a, a bit of a cheeky one. I kind of like it, but we need to see how we answer that. Uh, I read it out and then I make a comment to it first. Um, so do you sell Ethereum clearly doesn't compare to Hedera. Um, I would say let's not answer that in terms of a investment type of advice, but perhaps we can answer that in a way um, comparing a little bit Ethereum as being kind of the um, most prominent um, smart contract protocol and how does that compare to Adera. I think technical points we have covered, validators we have covered, perhaps in terms of user adoption. So where is the Ethereum community and where is the Hedera community and how does that relate? And perhaps Charlie, jump in if you have also comments on, on that regard. Uh, well, so in terms of adoption, I mean, Ethereum has the huge community, right? They just have an enormous community uh, and that's yeah. clearly in, in their favor. They yeah. do have problems in terms of maturing the technology and it's, it's often the, been the case that some of the some of the time it's not been technical problem. They have technical issues, but it's not always technical issues. It's governance issues, and getting the community to uh, agree to a, a path to choose a path for yeah. for the platform as a whole. We don't have those problems. Right? I mean, we structured things so that we won't have those problems mm -hmm. um, for exactly that reason. For, you know, you know we, we want to be able to, we, we already have tech that is superior in terms of, of security and throughput, uh, where we are lacking compared to Ethereum is global awareness and, you know, early network uh, adoption. And, and, you know, they have, they have enormous scale. The, um, we, we are focused on enterprise. And, and that is a little bit different. It's not that yep. enterprises don't consider Ethereum, they do, but what ends up happening, or at least has happened in, with us, in, in our case, is that they will prototype or whatever and then move over to Hedera to go production. Yep. And um, so those are some differences. I mean, Ethereum, if they are able to make the transition uh, to um, proof of stake, then yep. they'll be well positioned and you know that that could happen uh but where we are today they're you know they're still a long way off and uh you know they've got some hurdles to overcome in that regard I, well, so one, one thing i think you know, people have different views on this but my view is that we're going to end up in kind of a multi-chain world I, I struggle to imagine a situation where there's just like one platform that everyone uses uh, I just wonder, you know, do you, and, and maybe, you know, absolutely. No, I see that today. Cases. Yeah, totally. I completely agree. And the most important, uh, most high valued use cases will not run on a single chain ultimately, yeah. right? They, yeah. Because they won't risk it. They, they, they want to, they, they, they'll, maybe they'll run on two chains simultaneously, or they'll be architected to run on one chain and have a failover to another yeah. in case something happens. Yeah. Uh, but yes, we are gonna have a multi-chain world. There ultimately will be interoperability uh, between the change that may be a while, but, but that will come. But I, I would take it a step further and I would say that the layers 
of the tech stack that make up the chains, the, the, plat the protocol platforms, will become more differentiated and you could see competition at those, at those different layers. For example, what we're doing with the Hedera consensus service, hypothetically, you could take Ethereum smart contract layer and replace the proof of work with HCS and, and make huge strides like, like that, right? Now, I'm not expecting that to happen, but it's, it's, it's possible. I mean, it, technically, you could do that. And I, I think that we'll see, um, we'll see competition at the consensus layer, as we've demonstrated with the consensus service. We'll see competition at the smart contracts layer and also at the layers above. And ultimately, you'll be able to ideally, you know, sort of mix and match the best breed in each of those layers. Yeah. That's really interesting. Yeah. I've, I've never heard of anyone actually talk about, yeah, swapping out a consensus layer between different projects. That would be a... If the projects were willing to do it, yeah. then you absolutely, you could do that. There's nothing that stops that. In fact, we have, I, I didn't mention, but we have EEA uh, running on HCS, the head air consensus service. And the same thing is true for Hyperledger. We got Hyperledger private networks and we swapped out Raft or P, uh, Kafka for HCS. And now you've got a private Hyperledger network that's outsourced its consensus to yep. Hedera. And that's actually a plug-in. You can get it today through the Hyperledger uh, Foundation. We're a member of, of Hyperledger. Same, and the same yep. thing is true for Quorum. Uh, you, you know, you would see this mixing and matching of, of yep. uh, layers. Yeah. Perfect. Well, these are good, good words to finish it off. Thank you so much, uh, Mans, for, for the interview and for your time sharing about Hedera. We are exci certainly excited about the project. Um, we have been since 2017 and we will continue to be excited about it as long as you keep up the good work. And yeah, well, thank okay. you so much from Hong right. Kong. Okay. Thanks, wow. Really appreciate it. Thank you for having me.